Uh, first of all, what we're going to talk about this evening is something that I care deeply about and have a passion for. And so when you hear the term private family foundation, understand that that term family, in fact, is what gives private foundations such meaning and such depth. What's interesting about a private foundation, and that's what we're going to talk about this evening, is we're going to talk about what is a private family foundation, um, how you can benefit from using a private foundation, and maybe more importantly than anything else, um, we need to know enough or be aware of this entity to such a depth and such a level to consider whether or not we even qualify to have a private foundation. So we're going to cover all of those areas, but I want you to sit back, I want you to relax, be prepared to have a good time, because we're going to talk about things that represent what I consider to be significance. And when I use the word significance, let me put it in a context that we can all appreciate. One thing that you'll hear about the Stewardship Institute, you'll always hear us say or challenge people to move beyond success to significance. And the reason we do that is because people get so locked into success, which is all about output, very seldom do they ever consider the possibility or the fact that there is something that goes beyond success called significance, which is all about outcomes. So we're going to explore both things this evening. And by doing that, by exploring that, what I want you to do is I want you to practice a learning principle this evening. Because if you practice this principle, not only will you leave empowered, but you'll have ownership of the material, the things, the topics that we talk about this evening, which I think is absolutely essential to the learning process. So here's the principle. I will learn by what I hear. i got to point to the right body parts here. I will learn by what I hear, what I see, and what I feel. I'll write down the things that I learn, and I will go do them. Okay, does that make sense? And I'll repeat that. I will learn by what I hear, what I see, and what I feel. I'll write those things down, and I will go do them. Okay? Now, that brings us back to the term private family foundation. When you think of family, what do you visualize? What do you think about? And probably more importantly, what do you feel? Okay? Because families are not only the, the essential building block or unit in society to determine whether a society, a society is going to be healthy or be ill, but it is, it's, it's everything. It's the laboratory. It's where, we, it's where we learn principles. It's where we appreciate and experience values. It's where we start to create our beliefs and all of those kinds of things. So here's the interesting thing about family. You're not going to find it in the Internal Revenue Code. Okay. So we might as well just come to terms with that. But you will find definitions and code sections on private foundation. So when you hear the word family, just appreciate the fact that it's a term that identifies the type of private foundation that we're talking about. And what that means is typically you have a private foundation that was created by a family member, and now it's directed, managed, and controlled by family members. And that brings out three elements that I consider to be absolutely essential for building wealth. Now, I hope your ears perked up on that one, because what we're going to talk about is we're not, not only going to talk about building wealth, but we're going to talk about the best way to protect it, preserve it, direct it, and make sure that that wealth can go from one generation to the next. In fact, what if I could show you a way to get a 691% return on an investment of $130? Would that be of interest to you? You come to the workshop tomorrow and I'll show you how you can get a 691% return on an investment of $130. And that's using your foundation. And again, that's just, one, that's just one end of the spectrum. On the other side, you take a look at the private foundation and just recently within the last year and a half or so, and I think we all recognize this name, Bill Gates. Okay? I don't know Bill Gates, I've never met the man, but I have followed his career. And it's fascinating to watch the evolution that has occurred in how he sees, how he thinks, and how he feels. Now, his wife, Melinda, Bill and Melinda, created what is called the Bill and Melinda Gates Family Foundation. And about a year and a half ago, Bill Gates took the largest dividend distribution that had ever been offered by Microsoft. Well, obviously, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, he has, he's, he's a decision maker within Microsoft. Now, this dividend distribution was valued at $3 billion, okay, billion dollars. Now, ordinarily, any other individual that would take that kind of a dividend distribution 
what would they be subject to as soon as they received that kind of a distribution? Taxes, okay? Now, in this case, Bill Gates may have or would have experienced what kind of a tax? A capital gain tax, all right? Now, if you take $3 billion and you apply a capital gain tax against that $3 billion, what kind of erosion of wealth do you think Bill Gates would have experienced? A third? 20%, 30%? It, it really doesn't matter. The point is, whatever it is, it's a lot, okay? Now, what we've got to do is we've got to appreciate and understand how Bill Gates looks at wealth because he is probably the epitome of a capitalist. And now what he's done is he's taken his, he's taken his thinking, his mindset from being a for-profit capitalist to now what we call a social capitalist. But here's what Bill Gates did. He designed his estate in such a way that that $3 billion, when, it become, when it's distributed, it goes directly to the Bill and Melinda Gates Family Foundation. Zero tax, okay? Now, the reason he was able to do that is because he had a qualified charity that Bill and Melinda Gates set up. They control it, they manage it, they direct it, and they get to distribute to those charitable activities, enterprises, or projects that they freely choose to participate in, all right? So what they're doing is in fact, or at least I appreciate, is they're showing us a model for not only building wealth and preserving it, but how to direct it and how, manage, how to manage it and certainly go beyond success to what we call significance, okay? Now, here's Bill Gates, and let's just kind of imagine for a moment that Bill Gates sits down with his accountant, and I'm sure he has a team of accountants, and he says, look, here's the problem. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be accepting a dividend distribution from Microsoft, and it's going to look like about $3 billion. What would you suggest that I do to best preserve and protect that $3 billion? What do you think the answer was? Maybe, maybe not. The foundation, perhaps. Maybe they aren't even aware of it. Now, in his case, I think they were because it was set up. But look at a normal circumstance. If you go into your accountant and say, there's going to be a dividend distribution, or I have a highly appreciated asset that we're going to sell, and it looks like we're going to have this kind of a capital gain tax liability associated with it, what would you suggest that I do? All right. Now, there's several strategies that they might suggest, but most of those strategies just offer a deferral. At some point in time, you're going to have to pay for that, you're going to have to pay that tax. In Bill Gates' circumstance, or let's say outside of Bill Gates' circumstance, you were to say to your, your accountant, there's going to be a $3 billion distribution, and he just simply goes, well, just pay the billion dollars, and you still have $2 billion left. It's not uncommon to hear that kind of advice, because in their mind, they're thinking what? What's the big deal? You still have two. What's the problem with giving away one? Okay, now, here's how Bill Gates looks at things. Giving away $1 billion, that was not a great obstacle for him because certainly he has more than enough. But what he sees is he sees that billion dollars times a return, times one year, three years, five years, 20 years. So he sees the potential of a cure for AIDS. He sees the potential for creating a whole new model for education. He sees and envisions a lot of good things happening with that money. Now, if he freely chooses to do nothing, and he engages in the strategy that's offered by government, then the outcome is going to be what? It's going to be gone forever, and it represents lost opportunity costs. But in this case, because Bill Gates structured his affairs in such a way, he was able to recapture that capital, and by having it go into the Bill and Melinda Gates Family Foundation, it now becomes what is called social capital, because why? Why do you think it's called social capital? What do you think? What do you think? Go ahead. It's capital that's devoted to the social needs or good or the betterment of society. Okay? Now, a lot of people would probably think, well, shoot, why would you want to do that? I mean, I can remember the day that my 12-year-old um, my son came home from school. He's 12 now. This was probably when he was 9 years old. I can remember the day he came home from school and, and how he knows my son very well. This is Greg. And he comes home from school and he goes, you know what, Dad? All of my friends think you're stupid. And I go, geez, Greg, I mean, what's going on? What did you say? 
Well, they asked me what you do for a living. I go, well, what did you tell them? Well, I told them you teach people how to give their money away. And they thought that was pretty stupid. And I go, well, Greg, you know, let's talk about that for a moment. There's probably a better response to that. But, but isn't that a normal perception? You know, not only with little children, but with adults. You're going to do what? You're going to give your money away? But what they don't understand is that all of us live in a world that's full of what? A lot of eroding factors, a lot of, um, a lot of forces that are at work to separate us from the things that we have. So what I want to do is I want to go to the board for just a minute, and we're going to create some definitions, and then we're going to see what it means to be a social capitalist and to see how we qualify. And not only that, but see that if we can't build wealth at a greater level and get greater results. And if we can do that, maybe we can do something very significant this evening. Okay? Now here's what we're going to do. Imagine you sitting, or sitting down with your, your youngsters or your children, and you have to explain to them what an estate is. What would you tell them? What is an estate? Now you have to understand, I've got, some, I've got some really young kids. You know, your kids may be a little bit older or whatever, but if you were to try to define or describe to them what an estate is, what would you offer to them? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's exactly what I do with my kids. You know, Dad, what is an estate? Well, it's our stuff, okay? Now, we can go into some more technical definitions and things, but let's just keep things simple. Because the more simple it is, the easier it is for them to understand. The easier it is for them to understand, the greater awareness they're going to have. And one thing that I've learned, if you can understand and you have greater awareness, you're going to have greater choices. And that's really one of the things we're going to talk about tonight, is just having more choices. And when it comes to wealth and it comes to our stuff, you can't have enough choices. Okay. Now, let's take a look at an estate. What kinds of things would you typically find in an estate? Okay, we've got real property, as in real estate. What else? What do you think? We, yeah, we got personal property, cars, boats, furniture, collections, collectibles. What else? Stock or equities. And isn't that what Bill Gates had? He had equity in Microsoft. He took the equity and he simply transferred or gifted that to the Bill and Melinda Gates Family Foundation. And by doing that, he took that equity out of his estate. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about that process. All right? What else would you, what, what might you find? Insurances, right? And retirement funds. Okay, I think you get the idea. I mean, this, this list could go on and on and on. And you could have a pretty complicated estate. On the other hand, it could not have, I mean, it perhaps not that much value, but it could be very complicated. In fact, I think if you looked at the Bill Gates estate, it's probably not that complicated, but it's huge. Okay, because you know as a capitalist where his devotion or commitment is. It's Microsoft. But we're also seeing Bill Gates, he's done something very unique with his stuff, okay? Because I think Bill Gates understands that when it comes to your stuff, there are a lot of forces at work that are determined to separate you from your stuff. And we'll just call these eroding factors, all right? Now, if we were to identify some of these eroding factors, what would they be? What kind of challenges are each and every one of us in this room facing on a daily basis when it comes to protecting, preserving, and growing our estate. We've got taxes. We've got lawsuits. Okay, Any kind of liability, next door neighbor. I mean, it can go on and on and on. It can be family. Uh, I don't know if any of you have experienced a probate, uh, but that certainly is an eroding process, isn't it? It just doesn't help build or bring families together. The thing of it is, is we know that we can start to minimize or eliminate a lot of these eroding factors if we do what? Do a little bit of planning. Just do some planning. That's what Bill Gates has done. 
And again, I don't mean to keep mentioning Bill Gates, but certainly he's somebody that we admire, respect, or certainly we know about. And the thing of it is, is you know what? Bill Gates is no different than you and I. I know he has a great deal of wealth, but with that wealth comes a great deal of burden. And he'll be the first one, in fact, he has said that in public. Now, here's what's interesting about Bill Gates. He recognizes that when it comes to his personal estate, there's only three potential beneficiaries of his stuff. And who would that be? Or who might that be? Or what might that be? The government, your heirs, or charity. Those are your three options. Now, if you freely choose to do nothing in regards to planning your estate, what's the likely outcome? The government. The government has a process in place for all of those who freely choose to do nothing, and it's called probate. And they will take control, and they will take charge of your estate, and they will make sure that all of these eroding factors that we face on a daily basis get satisfied. And what happens in a probate process is very often there's very little or nothing left, but even more importantly, it does not bring families together. In fact, it has the opposite effect. So even if we were to just put money aside and look at the real value of family and relationships, it has an awful effect on that. So we know that Bill Gates is not going to choose that option, right? I mean, he's a visionary, he's a leader, he's a thinker, so he's going to do something. Now, here's an interesting statement by Bill Gates. He made the comment that I plan to leave little or nothing to my children because I know it won't do them any good. All right? Hmm. Little pearl of wisdom there, right? Now, what do you think Bill Gates is saying? I'm a dad, you're a mom, you're a mom, you're a father, and we're all trying to do what? We're trying to figure out the best tools, the best tactics, the best strategies to not only protect and preserve our estate, but because it's more than just an estate. It's about our families, it's about our heirs, and we want to do the right things, we want to make the right decisions. But what Bill Gates was offering to us was a little bit of advice in regards to, you know, real wealth is not about what you receive, it's the journey that you that you encounter or that you engage in to that point where that wealth is turned over to the next generation. In fact, consider this. We, will, we are experiencing right now the largest generational transfer of wealth in the history of mankind. We're seeing that. It's happening right now. And again, there's only three options as to where that wealth is going to go. Is it any wonder why private family foundations are becoming more and more popular? because we know that probate is not an effective transfer of wealth when it comes to family. We know that just giving assets and or monies to our heirs and dumping it in their lap is not an effective, an effective way to engage in stewardship, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Certainly that leaves us with the third option, which is called charity. Now, it might be important for us this evening to discuss or at least define what is charity. What is charity in the eyes of government? What is charity in the eyes of society? What is charity in your eyes or in your heart? What does charity look like? What's it sound like? What's it feel like? Now, that's something that you're going to want to ponder and you're going to want to start to define for yourself because you have the right to do that. Now, let me just offer a government definition, okay? And this creates a huge opportunity. Charity is any activity that lessens or removes the burdens of government. All right, now if you want to go into the Internal Revenue Code, you can go to Internal Revenue Code Section 501c3, and it will clearly define what the government sees as recognized charitable activities. And again, that's what? Educational, literary, religious, uh, the arts. I mean, it, it's a very, very broad definition, and it's something that I would encourage you to look up, or at least look in our materials, and you'll see what that definition is. But what it does is it proposes a huge opportunity if you do what? Just a little bit of planning, a little bit of pondering as to where and wh where you want this to go and who you want to have receive it. Now, what Bill and Melinda Gates have, have done is they've created an exit strategy from what we consider to be all of these eroding factors. And what they've done is this. In building this exit strategy, 
they have come over here and they've created a, a charitable enterprise called the Bill and Melinda Gates Family Foundation. All right. Now, what I'd like you to do is look at this symbol and you give it a name. I mean, we're not Bill and Melinda Gates, okay? But we are mothers, we are fathers, we're dads, we're husbands. We have the same challenges, the same concerns. But let's give this foundation a name that we choose, all right? And let's, let's set it up in such a way that it's compliant with all of the codes and all of the laws that are required. And let's create a charitable enterprise or let's just call this our charitable estate. Now that's interesting. What's the difference between your estate or your stuff and a charitable estate? Now here's something I'm going to suggest, and you can think about this. When we're over here, all of this stuff represents what we in fact own, right? And in fact, most of this stuff, if not all of it, has our name attached to it, and that's what we call title. Now, what I'm suggesting or proposing this evening is that ownership is overrated. That there is, in fact, a higher form of ownership called stewardship. And all stewardshipping is about is acknowledging the fact that we came into this world with nothing, and we're going to leave with nothing. But while we're here, we have what? We have certain responsibilities. We have certain opportunities. And if nothing else, if we practice stewardship, I like to use the acronym that stewardshipping is an art. Accountability, responsibility, and trust. Okay? Now, with a foundation, what this allows us to do is to honor and acknowledge stewardshipping and make that a real process in our lives and our families' lives. And let me show you how this works. Over here in the Bill and Melinda Gates personal estate, they had certain equities or ownership in Microsoft, right? And what they did is by taking these equities or stock and donating it to the foundation, the foundation now became a stockholder, okay? And it just so happened that this stock was valued at how much? Three billion dollars. When they moved this stock from here to here, they put it in a tax-free environment, and by putting it in a tax-free environment, they agreed to live by certain rules and disciplines, but certainly irrevocably devoted this stock as social capital. Okay, But more importantly, what did Bill and Melinda Gates do or retain when they transferred this stock from their personal estate to their charitable estate? What did they retain? Money that would have gone to the government, so they recovered what would be called lost opportunity cost. They certainly retained control. Now let me ask you this question. Is control a vital element in wealth building? Absolutely, absolutely. What makes a retirement fund so frustrating? The lack of control, no control, because once you engage in that in exchange, you get a tax benefit or deduction, and you're going to defer that tax benefit until a certain age, but you essentially lose control because now it's so encumbered with rules and restrictions and things that there's very little that you can do with it other than hope that it will grow. Okay? Now, you own that retirement fund, but who ultimately controls it? Those that create the rules are legislatures. And I assure you, they have their eye on the retirement fund sector. And if they had their way, they would simply take it and combine it with Social Security because they look at that as a retirement fund as well. All right? Now, again, you can freely choose to do nothing and see what happens or you can do a little bit of planning and make sure that you're in a position where you can freely say, you know, I don't think I want to participate in that. I think there's another way. I think there's another option. Okay? Now, in our country today, we are so consumed with either or. Option A or option B. You're either this or you're that. You can either do this or you can do that, and that's it. When in reality, over here, there's a whole other option. There's a whole other option for living. There's a whole other quality of life over here.
but very, very few people ever take the time to understand or appreciate what that looks like. And that's really what we're talking about tonight, you guys, is in a completely different option, a, different, a completely different way of living, a completely different way of thinking. But you know what? We're not pioneering this. This has been around for years and years and years. In fact, this entity that we're talking about tonight is considered the gold standard in the nonprofit sector because of control, flexibility, and tax minimization. Those three elements. Now, I don't know about you, but if I have, if my desire or objective in life is to build an estate or wealth and to protect it and preserve it, direct it and manage it, and then pass it on to the next generation, I better have some control and I better have some flexibility. And if I can minimize tax, I'm going to be that much further ahead than the next guy, right? But we've got to do it properly. Now, understand that when it comes to taxes, taxes are, in fact, social capital. But there's two types of social capital. There's involuntary social capital, and there's voluntary social capital. What kind of social capital did Bill Gates engage in? Voluntary. If he had chose to do nothing, involuntary social capital or taxes would have kicked in and we would have seen a billion dollars go in a direction that you may or may not want it to go. On the other hand, by having a little bit of planning in place and having this entity called the private foundation established and put in place, they were able to engage in what is called voluntary social capital but it is both social capital, and therefore it's respected that way. Okay. Now consider this principle. To freely give is a virtue. To be compelled to give is a vice. Is that a true principle? Again, you ponder it, you think about it, and by understanding it and becoming aware of it, I want you to know this evening that you in fact have that choice. And I would dare say there isn't anybody in this room this evening that wouldn't prefer to what? To voluntarily or freely choose where that social capital is going to do the most good and be the most effective. The point I'm trying to make tonight is that you have that opportunity, okay? Simply by establishing what we call a private family foundation. Now, every time we move an asset from here to here, there are several things that occur that are to your benefit and certainly to the benefit of your family. Number one, anytime we move an asset from here to here, we create a tax deductible expense on your personal income tax return. Okay? Now there's certain limitations. You can only there's a deductibility limitation on your personal income of 30% on an annual basis. All right? But by simply moving this asset from here to here, you reduced your tax liability by up to 30%. The other benefit that you have is once the asset is in the foundation and you liquidate or sell that asset, all 100% of that revenue or increase from that comes back into the foundation without a taxable event occurring. Okay, So there's another huge benefit. The other benefit is, is by moving it out of your estate you never have to worry about that asset being subject to what kind of tax? Estate tax. Now, you may or may not remember just a couple of weeks ago, you may recognize the name Warren Buffett. Okay? Warren Buffett did something really unique. He donated, I think it was 40 or $34 billion to the Bill and Melinda Gates Family Foundation. Now, what an interesting thing to do. Now, we also know that Warren Buffett is what kind of an individual? He's a capitalist. But all of a sudden, he's become very, very interested in becoming a social capitalist. Okay, In other words, devoting monies and or assets for the social good. He created a foundation for his wife. I think it was $3 billion, and then each of his children, $1 billion. But he put $40 billion in the Bill and Melinda Gates Family Foundation. Now, what's going on there? Why would he do that? We do know that Warren Buffett understands what? Control, flexibility, and tax minimization. Do you know that when Bill Gates was asked what the key to his success was, do you know what his answer was? And it just dumbfounded everybody. 
He says, I studied and I know the Internal Revenue Code better than anybody else. And everybody was just stunned at that. He took time to understand and know the code. Now, what's interesting is when Warren Buffett donated all of that money to the Bill Gates Foundation, what do you think Bill Gates did with that $40 billion? He invested it. Well, if you're going to invest that money, why not invest it with somebody who's really, really good on maximizing or creating substantial returns? a gentleman by the name of Warren Buffett. So do you see what happened? Warren Buffett took money out of his estate, donated it to a recognized 501c3 or family foundation. The family foundation, their first responsibility is to receive the donation. Their second responsibility is to manage it. They then took the monies and then they invested them back with Warren Buffett's organization. Is there anything wrong with that? Not at all. But what did Warren Buffett accomplish with that strategy? Because that's what it is. It's a wealth building strategy. What did he accomplish? Do you think, do you think, Bill, do you think Warren Buffett is thinking in terms of who the beneficiary of his estate is going to be? Absolutely. Am I going to have this probated? Am I going to have it go to my children? Or am I going to devote it to charitable purposes? And he's now building his exit strategy and ensuring that it's going to go to the betterment of mankind or society. Okay? And again, these are big names. These are big amounts of dollars. But I want you to know that they're no different than you and I when it comes to what? Our estate, our family, the decisions that are involved. And you know, the thing of it is, is just as families are unique, so is every estate unique. Because there's no two estates that are alike. There are no two families that are alike. And you know what? When we come over to the Private Family Foundation, there's no two foundations that are alike. They're all unique. They're all different because families are different. But nevertheless, they're governed by the same rules, same disciplines, and they can all create outcomes that are significant. And that's what makes this such a great opportunity. All right. Now, let me throw some numbers up here to kind of give you another perspective. And I'm just going to use a number that's easy to do percentages with. Okay? And you can add zeros, you can take away zeros. I think that's irrelevant. In fact, when, when it comes to wealth, the perception out there is that no matter how much you have, you never have enough. That's the perception. But the reality is what? What you have is what you have. That's the reality. And the reality of it is, is what you have is a responsibility. And the more you exert or exercise your ability to plan, and utilize that responsibility, the more awareness, the more freedom, the more choices that you're going to have. But again, if you freely choose to do nothing, what happens? You become a victim rather than somebody that can make a difference. Okay, let's say that you make an adjusted gross income of $100,000 a year. All right, now by having a private family foundation, a private foundation in place, you can donate up to 30% of that $100,000 to the foundation every year and reduce your tax liability on $100,000 to $70,000. Okay? Now, these may not be the exact tax bracket percentages, but let's say that the tax liability on $100,000, depending on how many dependents you have, and there's a lot of other factors that are involved, but let's say the tax bracket or the tax liability on $100,000 is 28%. Okay, if we do nothing, if we do no planning, and that is our bottom line number, then we know that how much is going to go out in involuntary social capital. $28,000, it's pretty simple. Now you know why I'm using that number. On the other hand, if we exercise or utilize this window of opportunity by donating money and or assets, that equal 30% of that or less or exceeding it, depending on what you do, we can reduce, subsequently reduce our liability from $100,000. Now the liability is on $70,000, which actually drops us into a whole nother tax bracket. And let's say that's 18%. So you have a tax savings just simply by doing what? Implementing this 30%. Okay? Now when Bill Gates donated equity or stock from his personal estate to the foundation, 
he was able to deduct up to 30% of his adjusted gross income, or $30,000 in this case, or in his case, probably $30 million or whatever. All right. Now, what if what we donate to the foundation exceeds 30%? What happens to the surplus or the extra? It gets carried over to the next year. If your donations fall less than 30%, it's less than 30%. You just didn't utilize the full window of opportunity. Okay? So, let's say it's real estate. Real estate's kind of a unique asset, is it not? Now, Ruth, are you from California? Okay. California just is an interesting state when it comes to real estate, isn't it? Let's say that you bought a piece of property 20 years ago for $100,000. What do you think it'd be worth today in California? Okay, 750, let's just make it a million. All right, the number's not so important as much as there's a substantial increase, there's a substantial appreciation. Now, think about all of the pieces, think about all of the properties or assets that are sitting idle because of one factor. If we sell this property, we're going to experience a capital gain, and I don't, I think we'll just sit on it and see what happens. Maybe the market will go up more, and then we'll have the money to pay that capital gains tax. But as we know, the more it appreciates, that tax is going to go right with it. So it's, it's really a flawed thinking, but there's many people that are just simply sitting on assets that are non-productive because of what? This eroding factor called taxes. So they do nothing. Now, what if we could eliminate that eroding factor? What if we could eliminate that kind of thinking by simply taking this piece of real estate that's now worth a million dollars, we donate it simply by changing the deed from your name to the name of the foundation, it's now here, and then we sell the piece of real estate. And we recover all one million dollars, no capital gains tax. So we recovered potentially two to three hundred thousand dollars, which is 200,000 times a return times one year, three years, five years, 10 years. It represents a huge amount of potential as far as capital, all right? Now, one thing about real estate is you can only deduct the, the, you can only deduct the basis value of that real estate. So if we paid $100,000 for the real estate, then that's how much we can apply to the 30%. Okay, so in this case, it exceeds the 30%. So now we can take one year plus five more years to recapture the entire basis value of that property. If it goes past that, then we just simply lose out. But the point I want to make is this. When we take this piece of real estate out of our personal estate and we put it over here in our charitable estate, what have we now done with this asset? Because over here, it was just sitting idle. What have we done with that asset over here? We put it to work, okay? We sold it, we recaptured the capital, we're investing it, we're diversifying it, we're putting it to work, and we're experiencing that 691% return, which I'll talk about in the workshop, and I'll show you how it's done, okay? But the point, of the, the point I'm trying to make is, does this not represent an opportunity as an exit strategy? And this is what you're seeing with the very, very wealthy as far as their estate planning and their financial planning is they now have an exit strategy that determines or they determine who the beneficiary of their stuff is going to be because this entity here exists in perpetuity. It will exist forever unless or the trustees decide we want to conclude or close down this charitable enterprise or charitable estate. Other than that, it can go on and on and on. Now, think about the potential of that. <clears throat> Here's an interesting book. This is, uh, this is published by the Council on Foundations. It's called the Family Foundation Retreat Guide. Okay? Let me just read something real quick because it's interesting. And the fact that it's in writing, it must be true, right? It's not my opinion. But here's what they write. What is a family foundation retreat? And as I read this, I just want you to think about the possibilities. A family foundation retreat is a gathering of family members responsible for the governance of a family foundation. The retreat offers an opportunity for members to spend more time together than is usually the case. Often it is held in a location that allows for recreation or leisure activities as well. 
Although there must be some framework for the retreat, time is not as tightly scheduled as in a regular board meeting, thus allowing for more in-depth discussion of topics of interest. A board retreat will frequently focus on planning for the future. Boy, what a novel idea. Having a family get together periodically and plan for the future. Reviewing the foundations, core mission and purpose, which is one of the things we're going to do in the workshop. We're going to create a family mission statement. And the donors or family's values in relation to the foundation's work. Okay? Now, in that answer of what a fam family foundation retreat is, there was no mention of money in there. It was all about what? Planning, future, interacting, talking, and developing or discovering what are our beliefs, what are our values, where are we going to best evidence who and what we are as a family. Is it going to happen here or is it going to happen here? So think about the foundation as a charitable estate that what? that exemplifies who and what you are as a family. Now, what is a family? It's you and I. It doesn't matter whether you're a single parent, it doesn't matter whether the kids are grown up and moved on, it's, it's a family is a family, okay? And families have value and they have worth. And I would dare say, based on my experience, what I've observed, what I've seen, this is where families come alive. Over here, Families are continually challenged because why? You've got all of these forces at work that are putting pressure on the income providers, the moms and the dads, the kids and everything else, because over here the perception is no matter how much we have, it's never enough. And you know that that's a true mindset as to what people are thinking. But what the foundation does is it provides us another option, another way of looking at things, another way of experiencing what I call the quality of life. In other words, this over here can become what we call your perfect calendar. Okay? Now let's have some fun with that for a minute. Let's, let's, say, let's say that money, assets, all of this stuff over here, it's done. You have everything that you need, everything that you require, and because of that, you now have a permission slip to go and engage in those activities that matter most to you, or those things that you really have a passion for. Now, if that were the case right now at this moment, what would you be doing? Have some fun with that. What would you be doing? What are the things that you have a passion for or the things that matter most to you in your life? And what I want you to do this evening is if you get a chance, I want you to take some time and I want you to really explore that, and I want you to start filling this side of the board up with those things that matter most to you and the things that you have a passion for. Okay? Now, for some people, you know, it's doing family history. Some, it's missionary work. Uh, some, it's, it's amateur sports. You know, we've got an individual who has a passion for golf. You know what his foundation is doing now? He goes around to the high schools in the state of Utah, and he's introducing golf to the young women. And you know what he'll tell you? He says, I never, you know, as much as I love playing golf, I never have a problem finding a partner to golf with anymore. And now he sponsors tournaments and everything. But he's, he's, he's having a blast because he's living his perfect calendar. Now, the promotion of amateur sports is a recognized charitable activity. It's right in 501c3. That's what it is. And that's what he's done. So you can really make this list a lengthy list, but what it represents is what your passion is all about. Now, Think about this. If this list is full, and these are the things that matter most to us, why do we spend 5% of our time over here and 95% of our time over here? We really have to ask ourselves that. We don't know any other way. Or we are so consumed with this, protecting it, preserving it, because this over here, in most cases, is fear-driven. And, and if you're encumbered with fear, What's the, what's the reaction to that? You, you start to cocoon yourself. You start to go like this, okay? Because we know that fear does what? It disables. And when we're disabled, we become less aware and we have less opportunity to make choices, all right? Now, if we build a foundation, and this is the opposite of fear and it represents faith, faith empowers. 
fear disables, faith empowers. Now you have a choice. Do you want to continue to live in this condition, or do we want to proactively now appreciate and look at our estate as now being the means to a greater end? Now, everything that we do over here has meaning and purpose, whereas before it was just simply a burden. Now, can you, do you have a greater appreciation for what Bill Gates is doing now? He's already announced to Microsoft and the public that in two years he's going to be where? Working full-time for his foundation. That's his exit strategy because this is his passion. Microsoft now has become what? A means to a greater end that Bill and Melinda Gates have sat down and have determined for themselves what it is that matters most to them. And it wasn't software. But I think for a great part of his life it was software. And now they're starting to evolve in their thinking because they're starting to process who's going to be the beneficiary of our stuff. And they have freely chose the foundation to be the beneficiary. And they are going to find the cure for AIDS. In fact, two days ago, the Bill and Melinda Gates wrote a check out for $500 million to go to the organization in Africa that's treating people for AIDS. And they'd already written a similar check not too long before that. That has become their cause, their passion. Okay? And it's great. Now, what if, what if you by putting this foundation in place. And let me, let me just say something real quick. The Council of Foundations several years ago came out with a statistic that really surprises a lot of people. Certainly surprises a lot of financial planners, surprises CPAs, surprises attorneys. But the statistic was this. Over 93% of the private family foundations in existence have an asset base of less than a million dollars. 93%. And yet you go and you talk to a professional provider, and you know what their first reaction or first response to all of this is when you talk about a foundation? Well, you don't have enough. You're not big enough. You don't qualify. Okay? Now, what did that statistic just tell us? 93% of the private foundations out there have an asset base of less than a million dollars. Now, if you're living in California, that represents what? one or two pieces of property, and you're now in the 7%. Okay? Now, I appreciate the fact that a million dollars is still a lot, but they broke it down even further, and the majority of that 93% had an asset base of less than $100,000. Okay? Now, just based on that statistic alone, what does that tell you? Not only is it a lot of benefit, but you know what? the vast majority of the families in this country qualify. As long as they will do what? Just take a little bit of time and determine what their perfect calendar looks like. And that's probably the greatest challenge of all is simply changing, changing this mental mirror over here as to what the purpose of all of this is and what a future looks like. You know, if you ask most people what their future looks like, you just get a blank stare. Because most people today are what? They're living for the moment. Future? I don't know. But it's really important that we take time to understand what this end looks like. And the more we define it, the more we describe it, the more we articulate it, the more meaning and purpose this has. Particularly if we now know that we have a choice. If I want to take this piece of real estate and I want to sell it and pay the capital gains tax, I can. If I want to recover that capital gains tax and use it as social capital, I can do that as well. I can simply grant or deed the real estate to the foundation. It can be personal property. It can be any property that has an appreciated value. You can donate to the foundation. You can apply it to your 30% deductibility limitation. And then over here, you have it in a tax-free environment. Okay, now, let's take a few minutes. I appreciate your patience. You guys are doing great tonight. Let's take a few minutes and let's talk about this foundation because there certainly are some rules and disciplines that we have to what? We have to either come to terms with and we have to agree to if we want all of the benefits of this entity. All right? Now, anytime, let's just go through the first, or what I call the do's and the don'ts. Here's your first responsibility, and maybe you remember what it was. 
But as a trustee of this foundation, and keep in mind that a charitable foundation, a private foundation, by law, is a legal individual. But it's handicapped. Can't see, can't talk, can't hear, can't think, and it can't feel. So it requires what kind of individuals to do that for it in its behalf. It's an artificial person, so it requires natural persons to be the eyes, the ears, the mind, the heart for it. Those persons are called, they're given a title called trustee, okay? Which means as trustee, as trustees, you're the legal title holders of any and all of the assets in this foundation of which you are working for and on behalf of. Does that make sense? In other words, this foundation is an individual. But you're going to be doing all of the work for and in its behalf. So therefore, you don't own the property in the foundation, but you certainly do what? You control it. Okay? Now, we have, we have a creator of the foundation. We have trustees. Who's the beneficiary of the foundation? Mankind. Society. Okay? Charity. The thing that you have, the important thing with the foundation, is you get to choose who the beneficiary is going to be. And you have the flexibility to shift and change that beneficiary at any moment in time. You may have a year in which the family has devoted itself as a beneficiary, missionary work, or maybe education, maybe creating scholarships or those kinds of things. And then the next year you find out, well, you know, our children who are on the junior board of trustees, they could care less about missionary work, and they're certainly tired of education, but they love animals. And now you can start to shift your foundation to start to address some of the needs in regards to animals because the children have a passion for that. And that's what keeps this vibrant and keeps it alive. All right, so our first responsibility as trustees of this legal entity or enterprise, charitable enterprise, is to receive the donations. Does everybody here know how to receive a donation? It's not too difficult. Just as you receive money and or assets over here, it's the same process here. You have accounts, you have bank accounts, uh, you have holdings, you have, uh, uh, it's just moving one, from, one, from one hand to another, okay? If, if, if you have a personal bank account to accumulate monies and or assets over here, then over here you're gonna have an account for the charity or the foundation, all right? Now the important thing is, is you're the one who makes the deposits, you're the one that writes the checks, and you're the one who's gonna determine how those monies are managed and how they're invested. And that's your second responsibility, is to manage the foundation, to govern that foundation. And your foundation will have a governing instrument or document that will give you guidance. It will show you what your powers are, what the do's and don'ts are, the things that we're talking about right now will all be contained in that governing document. Because what we're going to do, you guys, as we create this enterprise, we're going to take all of the documentation, the EIN number and everything else that, that declares it as a legal entity, we're going to package all of this up and we're going to submit it to the exempt organization department of the IRS. Then they're going to take a look at it and they're going to review it. And they're going to make sure that that documentation meets all of the organizational and operational tests in order to qualify as a 501c3. And then what they will do is once they've done that and you meet that criteria, then they will send you a letter back stating that based on our findings, you are exempt from tax. Best letter you're ever going to get. Okay, and you can look at this if you want. All right? But the point is, is your first responsibility, receive. Number two, manage it. Make sure that you're compliant. And then number three, make sure that you're compliant with what is called the 5% expenditure rule. Okay? And here's what that means. In your foundation, you're going to have what are called investment assets, right? If we sell this piece of real estate for a million dollars, and we take that million dollars and we diversify it, and we put it in investment type vehicles, we do that for what purpose? Why are we taking those monies and investing them? To grow the foundation because we want more social capital, all right? Now, by law, what is required of you is to expend 5% of the net investment value of your foundation on an annual basis. Okay, is everybody clear about that? And we'll go into this in a lot more detail in the workshop, but I want you to be aware of, or at least know what the, what the rules, the do's and the don'ts are, the disciplines, okay? 
So 5% of the net investment value, all right? So let's say that we go ahead and we have this million dollars, we invest it and we get a 10% return, all right? So now our net investment value is how much? 1.1 million dollars. What is 5% of 1.1 million dollars? $55,000. This now becomes your expenditure requirement for your foundation. Now notice I use the word expenditure. What does expenditure mean? And sometimes you'll hear the distributive requirement. But what does expenditure mean? Spend. Okay? And again, just think about talking to a 10-year-old and explaining expenditure. Let's just keep it real simple. The expenditure rule is saying we must spend this much money. Now, we have to spend this much money on what kind of activities? And they give you guidelines on that. The first activity is grants. Okay, so any grants that you make out of your foundation qualifies as part of the 5% distributive requirement or expenditure rule. Okay, 5%. All right. Now, the other is administrative expenses. What's an administrative expense? Do, do for-profit businesses over here have administrative expenses? Absolutely. Are they tax deductible? Yeah, they're tax deductible. Okay, for the most part, they're tax deductible. Well, over here, we're not looking for tax deductibility. What we're looking for is expenditures that meet the 5%. So what's an example of an administrative expense? Office help or salaries. Rent, office space, utilities, office supplies or materials, computers, travel expense, travel expense, seminars, workshops. This isn't that, but it's Family Foundations and Law. This is the law book on Family Foundations, you guys. This is it. It's the best reference book you'll ever have. Just carry it around with you. Simple to read. It's even got, wow, it's even got some blank pages in there. You can write notes and things. It's the best book you'll ever have. This is it, though. This is the law book on your foundation, okay? Anybody can master that. All right, but the point I'm trying to make is any grants, administrative expenses, and again, that goes, we can go into a lot more detail on that. We'll do that in the workshop. Any program-related investments, we won't talk about that tonight because that's a discussion unto itself. Any set-asides and any asset purchases are all part of the 5%. Now, what is government saying when they, when they implement this 5% expenditure rule? What they're saying is, look, if you're going to have this tax-exempt charitable enterprise, we expect you to expend or have an operating expense of at least 5%. Okay, now let's go back over to the for-profit side. If you have a for-profit business, corporation, LLC, whatever it is, it could be a sole proprietorship, could your business survive on a 5% expenditure? No way. So what the government is asking you over here is not only very modest, but it certainly is very, very reasonable. Because anything beyond that, you get to accumulate and invest and grow tax-free within your foundation. Okay, As long as those investments and that growth is always for what purpose? The purpose you, that you define in regards to charity. Okay, So, your first responsibility is to receive, second responsibility is to manage, your third responsibility is to make sure that you're complying with the 5% expenditure rule. Okay, and then the fourth responsibility is to make sure that you're compliant with all of your filings. All of your documents are in order. Okay, and then on an annual basis, you file what is called a 990 PF. PF stands for Private Foundation. That is the document, it's the informational return or document that is submitted to the IRS that simply states or shows that you are meeting those requirements. And it's all based on numbers and explanations. It's a pretty simple return for a pri this type of a private foundation. It's not a complicated return. There's a lot of good tax providers that can help you with that. Now, the expense for having that return done falls within what? The 5% expenditure rule. What if your foundation wants to go out 
and do some research in regarding grants. Do you know that a private foundation has a 70 times greater chance of acquiring a grant than somebody who just comes off the street? Why? What do you think? It's designated or already been qualified as a charitable organization under 501c3 and grant providers already know that you have disciplines or rules that you've agreed to govern or play by. Whereas an individual off the street, they don't know, they don't have that kind of confidence, whereas you do, okay? Now, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we do all the do's, okay? And then what we're going to do is, what I want to do is just take a few minutes to go through the don'ts, all right? Now these don'ts, once we go through them and you understand them, you're going to understand the don'ts as merely being disciplines that are absolutely necessary for you to be successful in your private foundation. But what you're also going to find, and I had a, um, I have a good friend who's a tax attorney that came to one of the workshops, and he had to leave a little bit early, but he just kind of melt motioned and he said, can I say one thing before I go? Yeah, go ahead. You never know what a tax attorney is going to say, but yeah, go ahead. A little bit of a risk. But he said, I can tell you that the Internal Revenue Code sections on a private foundation are the only code sections in the entire code that are actually empowering. He says, you guys, congratulations, you needed to do this, see you later. And then he was out the door. Okay. Welcome back, you guys. Um, we, we went through the four do's. And, and again, I, um, we, we talked a little bit about the disciplines in regards to the private foundation are so important. And, and the fact that the Internal Revenue Code sections that apply to your foundation being 49, 41, 2, 3, 4, and 5, these code sections are actually empowering because what they do is they provide guidance as to what you can and can't do with your foundation to make sure that it's successful and it meets the needs of its purposes. So we went through the four dues. You must receive the donations. You've got to manage the assets and our monies and govern the foundation, number two, or number three, excuse me. You've got to honor the 5% expenditure rule. And then number four, you've got to meet all of the compliance requirements. So those are the four dues. And what we do with the Stewardship Institute is we, um, we obviously spend a lot of time in helping you to not only achieve those things, but when you attend the workshop, it's a workshop that's interact to participate in creating your foundation, which is so important. Because when you leave that workshop, your foundation is really, it's up and running. But not only that, but you understand it. You know how to run it. You know how to manage it. Now, is it everything that you will ever learn about foundations? No. Probably not, because there's four areas that you're going to continually be working on mastering or improving your skills, and that's management, governments, governance, investment, and governance, management, investment, and grant making. Those are the four areas that you'll always be working on improving your skills. Okay? But other than that, that's it. All right? So here's the four don'ts. Here are the things that you want to make sure um, that you are out of compliance with. Number one, no self-dealing. Okay, now, just that term alone, what, what does that sound or feel like to you? No self-dealing. What is that? There you go. It's as, it's as simple as that. Thank you. What you can't do is you can't use assets, monies, and or funds for your personal use. But you can use money and or assets for what purpose? The purposes of the foundation but you're the one that has to make that happen, okay? Here's another example. Um, let's, say that, let's say that over here, um, that Howie over here has, he works, for, he works for IBM or works for a big company, Microsoft or whatever, and he has a compensation package with them, and, and they come in and they just, uh, they take his office and they just remodel it, new office furniture and computers and the whole thing, and he really likes this stuff. And in his mind, he could, he could work much more effectively at home and so he decides that, you know, I'm going to take some of these pieces, and I'm just going to take them home. Okay, and then he starts to use them there. What did he just do in regards to the company that he worked for? He just took their property, and it's called stealing, because it was outside of his compensation agreement as to what he was going to be paid or compensated for services. He went beyond that. It's, it's really no different in the foundation, okay? As a trustee, you have a compensation agreement. You may volunteer and donate your time and receive no compensation. Whatever compensation you do receive, you calculate it, 
and then of course it comes back over here and you pay tax on it. But you get to control what that is, all right? As long as the compensation is reasonable. You can't be abusive, but it has to be reasonable. But the point I'm trying to make is, it's the same thing with the foundation. Any and all assets are used or there to, be, to further its purposes or your perfect calendar. But if you start diverting them over to just personal purposes, then you engage in what is called self-dealing, and then there's a penalty if you do that, all right? And usually it's a 15% excise tax. So you don't want to do that because if then you start to erode uh, your foundation, so you want to avoid any self-dealing. Number two, don't make any jeopardizing investments, okay? What that means is this, in your foundation, as the manager, you're going to take the money in their assets and you're going to invest them in such a way that you can maximize growth or return. All right, now if you're, not, if you're not a prudent or a good or effective investor, you may contract with somebody to do that for and on behalf of the foundation. But it's ultimately your responsibility. You can invest foundation monies in any recognized investment vehicle that exists. Now. What that doesn't mean is that you can take your foundation dollars and come to Las Vegas and walk into a casino and lay it down on a table and think that you're going to get a good return. All right, That might fall short of what jeopardizing or certainly incur jeopardizing what's called jeopardizing investment. In other words, you want to use care and prudence. You want to invest the monies wisely. You want to invest the monies as if they were your own. And in reality or in a way they sort of are because you're the legal title holder, but they do in fact belong to the foundation, okay? Number three, don't create or maintain excess business holdings. Now what that means is, is don't commingle nonprofit activities with for-profit activities. If you've got a business enterprise over here for profit and it's an LLC or an S-Corp or a C-Corp or however you have it organized, that's where it belongs. The foundation can only derive one type of income, and that's called passive income. Your for-profit activities derive what kind of income? Non-passive income, okay? Or income from a trade or business. Over here, we only derive income, passive income from what kinds of things? What would be passive income type of vehicles? Rental properties are? Any, any equities, stocks, commissions, royalties, patents, all of those represent passive type income, okay? So you really have a lot of flexibility. Now also keep in mind that within restriction, and we'll go, more, we'll go through it in more detail in the workshop, but within restriction, the foundation can be one of the equitable owners in a for-profit enterprise. In other words, if you have an LLC, the foundation can be a member of that LLC. If you have a corporation, it can be a stockholder. If it's a partnership, it can be one of the limited partners. Now, there's some restrictions as to how much equity it can own, and we'll go over that in more detail, but nevertheless, those positions all represent when there is a distribution of what type of income. It's passive income, so it's okay. And certainly you saw that with Bill and Melinda Gates with their foundation and receiving a distribution from Microsoft. They were one of the foundation was one of the equitable owners, and that was passive income. Okay, so that you don't want to, there's really no reason to violate that and you want to stay within that. And then number four, don't make any taxable expenditures. And what that basically or primarily means is this, don't use your foundation dollars to engage in any kind of a political campaign or activity or the promotion of any political candidate. In other words, just stay out of politics. Okay, don't use the foundation monies for that. All right, and I don't think there's anybody in here that desires to do that anyway. There's a lot better things to do with your money than try to get one of those rascals back into office or whatever. But just stay out of that sector and you'll be fine. The other thing, and, and when it comes to don't making taxable expenditures, if you wanted to make a grant to an individual who is not a 501c3, you cannot do that unless you exercise what is called expenditure responsibility. And once you exercise that, it's fine. And again, we'll talk more about that in the workshop as well because that takes a little, bit of, a little bit of time to go into detail. But you guys, those are the four do's and the four don'ts. And again, I hope that you can appreciate the fact that those disciplines are absolutely necessary. If they did not exist, what do you think would happen with the nonprofit sector? It would be compromised, it would be abused, and it would go away. 
So all of those disciplines are for what purpose? Is to make sure that you, in fact, honor what, in fact, you have de what you desire to do in this foundation. Okay? So let's go over real quickly. The four do's are what? Number one, receive the donation. Number two, manage that. Number three, comply with the 5% expenditure rule. And number four, meet all the filing requirements. Those are the four do's. Okay, the four don'ts. Number one, no, thou shalt not self-deal. <laughs> number two, thou shalt not jeopardize, engage in jeopardizing investments. Thou shalt not excessive business holdings. And number four, thou shalt not engage in taxable expenditures or politics, that kind of stuff. Just stay away from it. All right? And so those are the four do's and don'ts. You guys, the foundation is a vehicle for you to not only build wealth, but to build wealth with purpose. And I don't know about you, but consider this possibility. As your life moves along and you strategically start to shift or implement your exit strategy and you start to shift assets from here to here, see what that looks like. We moved a piece of real estate over into the foundation because why? We wanted to get that property productive, we wanted it active, and we recovered the involuntary social capital by moving it from here to here, and now it's productive and it's going to work and it's growing, and with that, we have eliminated or minimized any of the eroding factors, okay? But in our personal estate, it's gone, all right? It's gone forever. But over here, it exists how long? Forever, okay? Now, we've got some personal property. Maybe we have some collectibles, some artwork and things, and we get appraisals on them, and we take that property, and we donate it from here to here. What have we accomplished? We relinquished ownership, and we claimed stewardship, okay? Same thing with stock and equities. We implemented our exit strategy, and now we've gone from ownership to stewardship. Now, is our wealth in decline? Not at all. In fact, it's growing now at an exponential rate. Because if you get a 12% return on your money, you have 12%. If you get a 22% return on your money, you've got 22%. All right? It's not taking a hit every year with tax and some of the other things and then starting all over again. All right? And then again, insurance. Do you know that you can take insurance and just simply change the owner from an individual to the foundation and now all of the premiums and everything fall within the 30% because the foundation owns the insurance. Okay, if you have a piece of property with a mortgage, you can hold the mortgage over here, make the principal and interest payments, and the whole mortgage payment is tax deductible. Why? Well, we know interest is deductible. The principal is deductible because you're making the payment as a donation for the foundation. All right? So it's a little strategy, but they start to add up. Okay, so insurance, retirement funds, obviously there's some restrictions there. But ultimately, what has happened? All of these assets are now over here. And where are you now devoting 95% of your time? Living your perfect calendar. Engaging in those activities that matter most to you, the things that you have a passion for. Now, I don't know about you, but um, the reality of getting up there in years is becoming more and more evident every day in my life. And I do know that if I, can, if I can start working more and more over in this area, I know what kind of results I'm going to see in my life. Now think about this. There was a gentleman that, um, uh, that shared this some time ago that really had an impact on me. A man, will hard, a man will work hard to make a living, but a man will work harder for his fellow man. But a man will work hardest of all for a cause. Okay, now... If that, in fact, is true, if it's true, then I think it's incumbent upon us to do what? Let's put it to the test. And now I'm going to ask you to consider or think of this possibility. What if every family in this country identified a cause? What do you think the result would be? I don't know either, but it would be good. It would be good, okay? Because people are now no longer immersed in just surviving 
or having all of their well-being or their identif identity being identified with assets and or things, and now they're engaged in making a difference. And that's what we mean with the Stewardship Institute when we say take the time to consider moving beyond success and live a life of significance. And I really do believe that this is a solution to many of the problems that we have because I do know this. Here's the neat thing about this entire opportunity or program. When you establish your foundation, each and every family is going to go in completely different directions because why? Because their passions are different. But here's what's neat about the community. It transcends religious beliefs, race, nationality, any other of the prejudices or anything else, you now just belong to a community of people that want to make a difference. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like a good place to associate. Just associate with people that want to make a difference. And that can be very, very empowering. So are there any questions? Here's what I would encourage you to do, and obviously invite you to do, is to participate in our workshop. It's a full day. Uh, the purpose or the objective of the workshop is for you to participate in building your foundation. So when you leave that workshop, again, as I said earlier, your foundation is up and running. You understand it. You know how to run it. What we're going to do is we're going to navigate the whole process by going through a number of exercises. We're going to do a lot of role playing. It's going to be very interactive. Therefore, it will be fun because everybody's activity becomes important. But when we get through all of that, you'll have a mission statement in place. You'll understand the do's and don'ts in depth. We'll go through the governing document so that you know what it means, why it's important, and how this becomes your governing instrument and what you do or what you don't do with your foundation. We will clearly define successorship so that as you develop and create your foundation, at the same time, you're educating and training the next generation to do what? To take your place. Because what's going to happen, you guys, is all of these assets are going to be irrevocably devoted for charitable purposes forever. You have the advantage of the creator to put all of the, put to, to declare the intent and clearly declare the purposes of this foundation of which any successors must keep in place. So it's, it's an incredible vehicle for legacy because your beliefs, your values will exist in perpetuity. Unless the trustees at a point in time say, okay, we want to close this foundation out. If they do close down the foundation, what happens to all of the assets? They go to another charity. They are irrevocably devoted to charitable purposes, and therefore they must stay in that, in that sector, which is fine because, again, there's only three potential beneficiaries of your stuff. It's inevitable. Government, your heirs, or charity. That's it. So why not have it here doing things that are good? And we often use the statement, you know, when you set up your foundation, engage in doing, you know, doing well by doing good. And again, I will, uh, I'll conclude on this note. Um, uh, some, day, some time ago, my children introduced me uh, to a man uh, for the, most of my life. didn't really matter to me because I didn't really understand or care. But they introduced me to a man um, that they found to be significant in their life. And his name was Martin Luther King. And a lot of years, I just, you know, I was kind of oblivious to the whole thing. But my children introduced me to his speech. And my daughter, uh, who will be here at the workshop, she had the speech memorized. And as she was stating those words, they just cut to my heart very, very, very quick. But in his honor, what you'll find is in the guidebook that we use in the workshop, we use his quote. And the quote is, everyone can be great because everyone can serve. And I really, truly believe that. So I want to thank you guys for being here this evening. Um, we've got a great work ahead of us. And in order to engage in that work, we've got to put some things in place. And once we get organized and get our planning and things in place, we've got huge permission slips to now go out and do things that other people can't. And just think about this. You will be amongst the few that are willing to do what the many are unwilling to do. And that's what leadership's all about. It's very, very powerful.